Well, hello guys. Hello. Um, viewers in the future, we were here. Um, but unfortunately, Facebook is not working at the moment for us. And so we're going to have to upload this after the fact. So if you have questions or comments or stories that you want to share, uh, please do so in the comments on social media and uh, make sure to tag us so that we can answer you um, and discuss anything that you know this conversation may, may bring up for you. So um, thank you for coming. This is um, the Boston Canvas Week Dads panel. Last night we did a conversation um, from the point of view of the moms and tonight we get to talk to dads. And um, you know I'm really excited. I think that that the dads we were just saying as we were setting up for the meeting is that the dads don't get their platform as much or as often or as regularly as as moms tend to do when discussing parenting issues and you know, statistically speaking women are the primary caretaker of the household but it's you know not as you know black and white as it once was in cultural history of our country so um i'm really excited to talk to um these dads that we have here today so uh so why don't we go around and just introduce ourselves scott Hi, I'm Scott Patano. I'm one of the co-founders of Boston Cannabis Week. I am a dad to three children, 12, 10, and 9. And I've been involved in the cannabis industry in one way, shape, or form um, over the last 20 years. And I uh, just want to thank everybody here um, to supporting Boston Cannabis Week and these panels that we're putting together. Uh, we will be back this year um, with a full week of events, September 20th to the 26th. So stay tuned. We have some good announcements coming out uh, about that. Um, as always, we want to thank our partners, Elevate Northeast, and of course, MCR Labs um, for their support. And without further ado, I'll kick it over to Joe to introduce himself real quick when, on the MCR Labs thing. Appreciate it, Scott. Yeah, so uh, my name is Joe Crinkley. I'm the PR manager at MCR Labs. Uh, I've been in the industry and with the company since uh, 2017, so, you know, not quite four years. Um, you know, we, we do cannabis testing, so, you know, if you're uh, an operator coming into Massachusetts, call us up. If you're somebody growing your own medicine at home, call us up. Sean? Hey, my name's Sean Judge. Um, father of four I got a 24 22 seven and five um three girls one boy um I've been a patient since uh roughly 2010 uh consumer a little bit before that but um I really got into um the science of it and the actual um intended use when my daughter who was 15 at the time was uh, diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma um, and saw the difference that it made in just her everyday uh, well-being and it carried her through into, um, you know, so far, thankfully it's coming up on eight years remission. And I've done a lot of work with uh, combat, well, veterans in general, but I am a combat vet and um, I like to do whatever I can to take the fight to um, legislation to get access to better care um, not only for myself, but, um, you know, other, because usually what happens with us is, you know, once we start making a stink, it trickles down. Darrell? Oh, guys, um, my name is Darrell Black. I am uh, an expecting father, uh, maybe in the next two weeks or so, so uh, pray for me, y'all. But um, <laughs> I first child coming, um, I do a lot of uh, advocacy work in the uh, in cannabis, and I am a retail manager over at uh, Pure Oasis, and um, I have done a whole bunch of community outreach in um, Massachusetts for the last three years, and I'm just excited to be on this panel to learn, really, just to learn, because I don't really have a lot of insight. No, we were saying before we started, ask Darrell a bunch of questions now and how, you know, what he's expecting and then six months down the road, see how he Seriously. does. Seriously. We need to write down these questions. <laughs> Sebo, tell us about yourself. Hey, what's up, everybody? My name is Sebo Shen. I formerly was the CEO of Hanu Labs and Vape Exhale. I'm currently their 
chief product officer. I am a father to two beautiful daughters, uh, ages 10 and six. Um, in my spare time, I've been running a uh, men's coaching circle to help men with doing inner work and inner child work and getting more emotionally intelligent. And I enjoy doing, obviously, jujitsu at the wrong times of the day. <laughs> nice to meet everybody. Nice to, nice nice to, to see you all. But Sabo, it's a different, uh, different time of day for you, it seems. Now you're out on the West Coast. Nice. Enjoying, enjoying that Cali sunshine. All right, guys. So, um, so last night we talked a little about how um, different moms have been in different positions to sort of have to defend um, their parenting, their parenting decisions, um, and, and, and their children um, as cannabis consumers, medical patients, um, and, you know, and moms. And I know that those experiences can be really different um, from the dad side. So um, Scott or Sean, one of you want to sort of sort of walk us through some challenges that you've had while dealing with um, being a dad in the cannabis space and, and being a single dad at that at times? Sure. Um, my experiences, fortunately for me, um, with the family courts or in the past. Um, about five years ago, I went through an, uh, a divorce with my ex-wife and going through the custody battle, the strategy from um, her attorney was to pinpoint the fact that I was in the cannabis industry. Um, I had had custody of the children at the time and they kept drilling home to the judge the fact that I worked in the cannabis industry. It was a danger to the children and the type of business that I was engaging in, in the cannabis industry was a startup business and it made me financially irresponsible for the children. Um, the judge at the time used that to rip the kids out of my arms and give custody to their mother at the time, um, who was not, you know, based on the court appointed therapist's opinion, was not in a position to have full custody at that time. So they ignored the court appointed therapist recommendations all because of my involvement with cannabis. Thankfully, I fought, I appealed that decision. The appeals court in Massachusetts, I will say, has a much more um, open view to cannabis, especially now that we have entered the legal world within Massachusetts. So the appeals court overturned the decision. And by this time it had been two years, my ex-wife and I um, had found some common ground and we became friends again. And we decided enough is enough. Let's do what's right by the children. And as it came out, it wasn't her pushing the cannabis stuff. It was her attorney's strategy because it was the only thing he had to go on. It was something she was doing to fight for her children. But the fact that he was able to use that and manipulate the court system just goes to show um, how easily fathers can be painted in a bad light because of our, you know, I feel like a dad in this space is painted as like this drug dealer monster that is doing harm to their children. Um, whereas, you know, moms, family courts usually side with the mom to begin with, right? But then you put us into this new, um, this new industry that people don't understand and we're surrounded by these stigmas. It's just a bigger challenge for us. But that's the, the one saving grace is that appeals court. I mean, the sad thing is, is it cost a real, it cost a mint to be able to appeal and get to that level. But at the appeals level, it's no longer family court and they have much different views on cannabis and the legalities of it. Now, Sean, I know you're going through some different things currently. Yes, um, a lot of it, I really can't speak on at the moment. Um, I can tell you that my past involvement with the courts, um, knowing that what I was going, and this was, you know, early on, um, I, would you say this was five years ago for you? 2016 was when the judgment came down against me. I hit literally, it was the weekend of the Boston Freedom Rally. We had just had one, the biggest rally 
there had been for the vote on, for legalization. And that Monday, I got a call from my attorney and he says, you need to get an appeals attorney. He's like, they're taking the kids. Yeah. Um, thankfully, that's not my situation. Um, and, you know, when you told me about it the other day, um, it broke my heart. Um, what I do have, you know, tangible experience with that um, being a cannabis patient and consumer uh, going through drug courts, through the veteran treatment courts in two different states now, um, I've had such a positive experience just based on the fact that, you know, I was, yes, um, based on the fact that I was a patient, I was able to self-advocate and do so intelligently, um, and it become a much more accepted uh, treatment, even in a veteran's uh, treatment court. And at, <clears throat> my first charge um, were opiate-based, and um, I ended up with uh, 33 Charlies. And when I told um, you know the uh, probation department what I was hoping to be able to do, they, it was very new to them and she was very open to it. And it was because solely on the fact that I was a father. Um, and at the time it was um, just two children and that they knew that one was going to be on the way shortly. Honey, here it is. Yeah, no problem. And through doing that, um, I gained a lot of momentum for the, um, I'm cooking it, hold on, so, <laughs> never read Multitasking as a dad, I love it. The chef server, um, but it was a very positive experience, and then the second time around, um, it wasn't even a question, it was part of their standardized intake for the um, process. And when I disclosed that I was a medical cannabis patient, um, it was like, all right, well, you just can't pop pot on any UAs after that. Um, I'd say that my biggest hiccup in all of this as a, a father was that um, it's a federally legal substance, you know, it's still and even back then, it was looked at as equally as bad as, you know, heroin or um, I couldn't I couldn't make any progress in the VA in receiving health care um, that was competent. And they knew that I was that I had been clean off of opiates for years when I started, um, um, you know, disclosing because I didn't disclose to them anything about my cannabis use until a little bit down the road and I've been through each VA system in New England um, and none of them gave me more of a problem than the um, Rhode Island VA in Providence and a lot of the um, stipulations that they were giving me were um, you know we, we won't it was all quick pro quo stuff we won't do this unless you do this and you know I have a pretty strong healthcare background and I know that's just not how it works, you know. Um, the, the process took me through five primary care lives, uh, three of which was two of which were nurse practitioners. And then at the final stage, um, I, I couldn't basically walk anymore. And they weren't giving me uh, an MRI. And I knew I needed an MRI for my spine. And so basically for eight years, um, I had been walking around with a growing tumor in my spine that by the time that they found it, it was the size of a ping pong ball. And um, I wasn't even using cannabis regularly at that point. I wasn't inhaling. I wasn't consuming it by mouth. And um, that, because I had that on my record though, um, in my charts, it surely um, impeded, you know, competent medical care. I think we lost Sean. But he brings up, 
really good point. You know, patients as as parents who are patients, and that's definitely something like I could you know talk about all day. But as pa as medical marijuana patients, parents are regularly discriminated against, um, and that is. You know, I think what Sean was just talking about is, you know, how, how it is to, you know, need a medication and then be penalized with your children and have that used against you. Sorry, Sean, we, you dropped off. What it's going to be like out here. Um, it's, I'd have to say that um, if it wasn't for the patient advocate who I, you know, ended up walking into the office with um, my uh, daughter, Danny, and him sitting down and talking with us like he even said that um at that point where he um went forward and spoke on my behalf is like he's like there's no reason to be putting parents in a position where they need to choose and to have a, a better life than the, um or to choose between having a better life that they're used to and not and um i'll forever be grateful for that man that did that and um i try to i try to bring them in with me wherever we go now um as long as it's safe because they are such a huge part of me. And like, when you see somebody walk in, especially of my stature, like, oh, look at this guy. But then you see him, you know, with my kids, like, that's just who I am. That's who we are. And um, I'm a full-time dad. Like, I, I haven't worked in years. So basically, I'm home with them um, a lot, or I'm with them a lot, taking, me, taking them places. I'm very blessed to be doing what I'm doing. That's what it comes down to. Awesome. That's a, that brings up an interesting point. Um, Joe, oh, you are work, you work a lot at MCR because MCR keeps everyone who works there very, very busy. Um, have your, how has being a dad impacted, because you're a recent dad, um, how, how has that impacted your, uh, your, your work schedule? Yeah, so I, mean, I forgot to mention it during the, the intros, but yeah, so I have two twin boys who I can hear screaming in the background right now. Um, they're they're going to be two next month. Uh, so that it's, you know, this is like the most challenging time parenting wise, and then I, I got double trouble. So I think the the biggest challenge with, you know, balancing work life and home life is just kind of distraction. When I'm at work, I'm, I'm always thinking about the boys. And then, you know, there are certainly times when I'm, I'm with the boys and I, you know, see a notification pop up on the phone and, and I get, get into work mode for a second and you stop like living in the moment and, and just being with your kids. And so, I don't know, just kind of balancing, balancing the, the work and the home life is definitely a challenge. Um, MCR has been really kind to me. Uh, they, they gave me a lot of time off. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the world has not. It, it gave me a, a pandemic to also have to deal with at the same time. So, you know, not not quite as uh, heavy of a situation as what Sean has had to deal with. But, you know, there was a time when, you know, my wife was a, a frontline healthcare worker. So she was going into the hospital and, and coming home every day and, you know, immediately showering before she could touch any of us and all that stuff. Uh, and I was home with the kids all day trying to, to both work and, you know, figure out how to do this. Cause it's, you know, all of us and Darrell, you'll, you'll learn soon enough. You know, everybody's got a plan until you've got a baby slapping you in the face. So, uh, but you, you figure it out, you learn as you go, you, you try, you fail, you succeed and uh, it all gets better. Sebo, you're all the way over now in, in that uh, state where you've had legal weed to some capacity for a very long time. And this conversation maybe isn't as relevant over there because it's all so normalized. How do you think that affects your ability to parent alongside fellow fellow parents in the PTA or your, you know, your children's friends' parents, et cetera? How do you think yeah. that your relationship to cannabis affects you out in California? Because when, when I was become, before I was a mom, that was a big concern of mine was that uh, it would be, I wouldn't be able to find mom friends. Yeah, absolutely. Very salient question. So you are right. I do live in California. You know, we've had some form of medical marijuana since the late nineties. So, um, you know, I've definitely have a different experience, but you know, there is still quite a bit of stigma, you know, um, especially amongst the older parents. But I would say that, you know, the parents that are, I don't know, 35 and under, 40 and under, uh, they tend to be quite open-minded, especially out here in California. But 
Uh, my daughter is in fourth grade now, but in kindergarten, you know, my wife was very worried about what the other parents would think um, if they found out that I was a, uh, uh, in the cannabis industry. So she said, hey, you know, just make sure everyone likes you first before you tell them what you do. And, you know, I thought about that on the way to school and I was like, okay, okay, I'm going to implement the plan. I'm going to implement my wife's plan. And when I got to school, you know, when they asked me what I did, you know, at first I was like, yeah, you know, I run a company. We, we create herbal delivery systems. And, and he goes, you mean cannabis? And I go, yeah, yeah, cannabis. And then I was like, oh shit, I, I guess I just, you know, I messed up that plan. But, you know, what was interesting, what came out of that was, well, number one is I was president of the PTA um, that year as well. But uh, a lot of great things came out of that. Actually, one of my major investors came out of that. I would say half the parents are my customers in that <laughs> class. And um, yeah, it's been a beautiful experience because I, I, I am pro cannabis, but I am not someone that tries to glorify uh, what cannabis could do for you. I'm very realistic about it. You know, like I, I understand that no one has ever overdosed on cannabis, but I have tons of friends that wake and bake every day that, yeah, you know, like we're 44 and they can't remember where the last 24 years went, you know, and many of them haven't achieved the potential that they could achieve, but, you know, they've, they've still been somehow to contribute to society, but I always thought, oh, wow, they could have done so much more. Um, but without getting off track here. Yeah, the main thing here is, you know, I understood that if I could talk about cannabis in a much more objective way, really talk about the benefits through the scientific language, then it's really hard to argue, you know, with peer reviewed studies and things of that nature. And, you know, in the early days when we didn't have as much uh, reviews from Israel, and we couldn't quote Dr. Mashulam, you know, like I was really kind of telling a lot more anecdotal stories. But today, when we talk about CBD, CBG, you know, the acidic versions, all the terpenes and how they interact with the biochemistry in your body, you know, it's really tough for those that don't believe in cannabis to be like, well, that's still bad, you know, because they'll have to counter your science with more science. And typically they don't have the science other than the anecdotal stories that they had heard. So it's, it's been to me, you know, I, I love it when I find resistance because I've always taken those opportunities as education opportunities. And then this leads to conversating about, okay, well, if I'm open to cannabis, how do I explain it to my kids? And I tell them it's really simple. You be truthful, you be transparent, you tell them the pros and cons, and you give them the ability, the sovereignty to make up their own mind if they want to try it or not. And that's the way we've, I mean, for the last four Thanksgivings, we've had dab bars, you know, at the family uh, uh, a dinner table. And what I could tell you is we have teenagers as well that um, uh, are at the Thanksgiving dinners and they don't, th they don't look at it any different. They're like, oh, that's what Uncle Sabo does. It's actually, it's not that cool because Uncle Sabo does it, you know, but no one thinks like it's weird. No one thinks it's, no one thinks it's super cool. No one thinks it's not cool. It's just normalized. It's like broccoli. Some people like broccoli. Some people don't, you know, it's just one other thing that you could try at the Shen household. And yeah, hopefully that answered your question, Kara. Yeah, for sure. I, I love that you guys are all sharing these very personal stories and I, and I definitely appreciate it. And I have a note that says, make sure to thank everyone for sharing after they talk. And then I forget to read the note and do it. So group, thank you. Darrell, how, as a cannabis consumer, how do you think the, your, how, how do you anticipate your cannabis use affecting your parenting decisions? Like, what are you, what are you sort of anxious about as, you know, yeah, as you join the, the parenting world and how it relates to cannabis? Uh, I've just been like, so I, I wanted to like, there was a, there was always a plan in place while, 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 you know, the nine months was happening. This month I'm going to do this and get off of this and scale back and then those months come and that's not what happens. And so like, I think I'm just going to be like, hopefully I'm going to just, you know, I don't know. I'm so like, I'm just like so anxious about everything. I'm just so nervous about everything. Like there's so many questions and so many variables that's in my head. Like, I don't know if I'm going to have the same smoking habits. I don't know if I'm going to have the same smoking routines. Like even now uh, with me, you know, I'm a, I'm a patient and, you know, there's certain times where I feel like I should uh, I, I, I have to go smoke, but now I know that's going to have to alter because of, you know, my daughter that's coming. So there's just certain, certain things that I, I know that's going to change just on its own. And it's not going to be because of me. It's just going to be because of her. It's like, she runs everything. And I know that, but 
I'm just excited for the for for the new beginnings. But um, I did want to like ask you guys like with with you guys being so you know prominent you know in, in the cannabis industry like does like in um and like does the light of that shine with, like the teachers with schooling with people that you that you, that you meet come across with other parents you know um I, I just i had to i have to ask that because that's one of those things that i want to know how to get some advice on and how to you know maneuver around that type of stuff well, you know it's funny um daryl it's like one of the the very first freedom rally that i one of the very first freedom rallies i went to um I was expecting like a much different experience. And I, wa I watched people walking around with their children through the common and stuff like that and exposing them. I'm like, oh, wow, I says, this is something I could actually bring the kids to. And the next day I did end up bringing my children to the Freedom Rally. And we were in a sectioned off area that was like a secure area. So they weren't out in the crowd or everything. They were away from everything. Everybody's super respectful about not smoking around them and stuff like that. I have some great photos of my son with a gro uh, GoPro and doing some filming for us and stuff. And they thought it was fantastic. For me at that time, though, that was just before legalization. Those photos came back to haunt me because they came up in family court at the time. Now you fast forward to where we are and like today was such an emotional day for me when I posted about this on Facebook, because I actually posted pictures of my children when helping me in the garden this year. And now I don't have to hide that stuff anymore, that they're around it, that I'm educating them and I can be open about it. So the, the times have changed. So now it's like I go into the school and the teachers will be like, oh, you, son says you're in the CBD business. He's like your best salesman. You know, so now it's like the, the conversations are happening, you know, kind of like Sabo said, you know, California was always a little bit ahead of us. And I feel like it's starting to come around here. And the, the people that have a problem with it, I feel like are people that are using it for their own agenda. Because even, you know, people like my ex-wife, like she had said, you know, we're the best of friends now. We're like a family unit. I was away snowmobiling three weeks ago with her her husband her her new child and it, it's it's the best thing ever and she has she's loving the stories and loving that we're doing this panel but that was her attorney using that for his agenda at the time to try to win a case and I feel like anybody that approaches it that way like kind of has an agenda so it'll certainly come back to you the question is is how is that person in particular person view it you know and if you're just you and doing things right then and educating your children right just you know take solace in that and that's like the best advice I can give be confident in yourself because I went through that period of having to hide it and I hated it and now it's like liberating yeah, if I, if I could add to that, Scott, um, and thank you for that. Uh, you know, this is the second time I've heard that story, but it's still very touching. And Darrell, you know, like, you know, especially, you know, I, I do live in a state where it's much more accepted, but, you know, there is still quite a bit of stigma. And what I found was, you know, the first step was like, all right, you know, I'll tell as many stories as I could tell to try to educate them. And then when I saw, okay, this is starting, it lands with some people, but it doesn't land with others. And I thought, okay, hey, let's, Let's contextualize the story. Let's tell this story in a way that will make sense to them. You know, let's not throw them into the deep end of the pool, you know, with like the high end diamonds and the concentrates and things. Let's, let's start with five milligram gummies and let, let, let's, you know, bring them on more uh, carefully, slowly and gently. But more and more what I've come to realize is it's not so much what you say. It's not so much even the context of what you say, but it's the energetic exchange that you have with that person. And when I talk about the energetic exchange, I hope I don't sound like some California hippie, but <laughs> what I mean by that is that, you know, if you're defensive about your cannabis use, if you have some shame about your cannabis use, then when you are ex explaining it to someone, when you're trying to um, espouse the values of it, you know, if there's a part of you that still has some like shame over it, like I'm doing something wrong, then there is some subtle energetic exchange that maybe the two of you can't pick it up on it, but deep down the other person picks up on it and can't receive the message. So what I found was most useful for myself was really working on myself on, okay, hey, 
Like I know cannabis is okay. I know I'm in the cannabis industry, but you know, I had, before I got into the cannabis industry, I had 33 years of life experience where people told me this was bad, that I was doing something shameful. Like, you know, in my culture, cannabis and heroin and cocaine are all classified in the same category. You know, there's like no nuance, like, okay, Sabo is just doing cannabis. It's like, my dad's like, oh shit, Sabo is like he's doing heroin now, you know? So what I realized was I needed to get, I needed to become whole with that part of me that still had a little bit of shame. And even though it was only like a half percent of shame, once I got rid of it, then I realized I could start communicating to people in a way that it almost didn't matter what I was saying about cannabis. They could just see that I was a grounded individual. They could see that I could use it positively for my life and that I had no defense. I had nothing to prove to them about whether cannabis was good or not. I knew how good it was for me and that would translate to them. So hopefully that's helpful, Daryl. Oh, that, that, I absolutely agree with that because a big part of, especially my more present day scenario is that I've been advocating for cannabis and myself for so long now. I don't need to jump into every fight or debate that I'm brought into. Like if I can see that a situation is clearly going to be out of my control and take more energy or um, time than I even want to, I don't even entertain that conversation because if, like you were saying, if their mind's made up already, you know, like I can just be living proof and just walk on out of there. Thanks for your time. I appreciate it because there's nothing they can really do. And um, even one of the last conversations that I've had, one of the defenses was I grew up in the eighties. I know what it's like. That to me just negates everything that I could ever say or do to change your mind. I don't have the time to bring you from the eighties to now and you know, any amount of time, you know what I'm saying? But that was, that was helpful. I liked how you said uh, the, uh, you know, even integrating the increments of from five minutes from, you know, instead of going from diamonds, bring them down to five milligram dummy, uh, listen to me, gummies, excuse me. I like that. And you don't sound like a hippie either, Sabo. Like we're big energy. I think we're all big energy people here too. Joe, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, no, you're you're you've relocated to a state that does not have legal cannabis at the moment, right? So you clearly wouldn't have any because that's illegal. But if you're talking to but if you're talking to other parents and they ask what you do, I don't know if you're if at some point you're dropping off or picking up from daycare or doing, you know, some sort of community sports. Do you have a hesitation being in a state in a, in, a, in a state that doesn't have legal marijuana to have that conversation? Yeah, so Florida does now have a, a medical program. It's it's a little more restrictive than some other programs, but there are some of the same brands here that are starting to pop up elsewhere. True Leaf and, and some other ones, Cure Leaf. Um, so it's not it's not non-existent here, but it's interesting because like when you do go to you know to daycare and you're you know hanging out in the in the lobby or whatever one of the questions that always comes up with parents is yes yeah, so what do you do and so that i i just kind of approach it as an opportunity you know i i'm honest that you know one i work for a lab which is which is nice and then i you know drop the little it's a cannabis testing lab and there's always that little moment of oh and and you just kind of respond to it you know kind of like sabo said you just be, you own it. And, uh, and you explain to them, it's, you know, the, the lab aspect of it really kind of helps because you have science on your side and you can kind of explain things in a way that, you know, isn't, doesn't have that social stigma with it. It's more, you know, facts and figures and products are tested. And, you know, these things that kind of bring cannabis to a level of, you know, food safety or, or anything else that they're kind of, you know, aware of and comfortable with. So, you know, it's, it's not more awkward being in a legal state than a non-legal state because there's always going to be that stigma everywhere with some folks. You know, even even eventually when federal legalization finally happens, there will still be people that, that look down on it. And, you know, anytime you interact with those people, you can give it a shot. And like like Judge said, you know, if uh, if it's not working out, you just, okay, you've got your views and, and we can just walk away agreeing to disagree. Yeah, that's that. That was a big concern of mine as well, Darrell, when I when I before I was pregnant. Um, 
Does anybody want to speak to how um, how can you how cannabis use affects their day in and day out parenting? Sort of how it influences your what you do or how you talk to your kids. Sabo, you see, you seem like you you're ready. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm just fearing for talking too much because I didn't want to hear a lot from the other fathers in this room. Um, but yes, for me, you know, I, I, I have a lot of intentional cannabis use um, in regards to interacting with my children. You know, uh, one of the things that I realized was I made a promise to my wife before I started my company that I would always be home for dinner and I would always be home for dinner. And what I found was, although I was always home for dinner, I was constantly like answering emails interacting with my phone. So physically I was there, um, but my mind was not there. And I had some sort of mental block about, you know, being activated in front of my children. Um, I just, you know, would usually wait for them to go to bed, but one day, you know, they, they, they came downstairs while I was activated and, you know, we just played some games together. And what I noticed was, you know, when I was interacting with them, I wasn't thinking about work. I was really getting lost in the activities with them. And I thought, okay, well, I may have stumbled upon this by accident this time, but the next time they were doing some arts and crafts, you know, I went upstairs, I got medicated and, you know, again, you know, I wasn't checking my phone and I found that this was a really great way for me to get present, you know, to really relax my mind, to stop thinking about my to-do list and things of that nature. And at this point, you know, I've done it enough where I, I, I understand now, you know, what the mechanism is um, in order for me to be present with my children. So with or without cannabis, I could get into that mind state now. But it was like, what I like to say, it was like training wheels. Because back then, even if I wanted to not think about work, I, I just couldn't, you know, like the thoughts about work would just enter in my head. So with the assistance of cannabis, you know, I was able to really focus on my children and really be present with them. And now that I understand what the reward of being present with your children is, and it really is a gift, you know, to really see them interact that way. And what I always tell people is my children would always want my attention all the time. You know, they come in, show me a picture. I tell them it looks great, blah, blah, blah. And then they would run off. And then five minutes later, they would be in and show me something else. And what I realized was what they actually wanted was 100% of my attention. And if I gave them 100% of my attention, then it could be as little as like 30 seconds is all they need. And then they feel satisfied. So yeah, cannabis really helped show me that being physically present with my children was not the same as being engaged and mentally present with them. And once I was able to see how great that felt and how much they benefited from it, you know, then it made it easy. It was like, okay, I need to figure out how to do this without cannabis as well. And now that I could do it with or without cannabis, you know, my relationship with my children is completely different. That's awesome. It's, it's funny because I was always super nervous to ever be medicated around the kids um, when they were younger. Um, I'm not the type of person who can smoke and go about their business for the day. Like cannabis helps me mostly at night to relax, unwind, and it helps me to sleep. And that's how I medicate. Um, if I smoke in the mornings or whatever, you know, I just can't get my stuff done. So I'm more of that couch lock type of person and but I will never forget there's a funny story I was on both probation and going through the child courts and stuff like that so I was subject to drug testing so for years I didn't smoke I would be out at the cannabis industry events Kara knows she, I remember so, that so many times she would try to hand me a joint and I'm like I can't um and so once that was over I I, I will never forget this I went down to um New Bedford, your former boss's place. And I was with Mick, the, the great Mickey Martin. And Mickey got me to do my first dab because I could now smoke. And I was on cloud nine. I was just, you first dab, you know, everybody likes to take everybody's dab virginity. And I couldn't move. And thankfully, I had this two hour ride home. And it started to wear off a little bit by the time I got back here where the kids were with the nanny. And so I got back and the nanny left and I'm sitting there going, wow, I'm still feeling this. So I'm like, I'm just going to go about my normal routine. I start to get the kids ready to get in the tub and they start fighting like crazy. And I just looked at the two of them and I'm like, why are you so upset? I'm like, how about we do this? And I sat there and the way I reasoned with them, they're like, thank you, daddy. And I went, do dabs make me a better dad? 
<laughs> so, but it, it gave me this pause to kind of sit there and, you know, instead of just saying stop fighting, which is, I think, most parents' normal reaction to when your kids, if you have more than one child and they start going at each other, you're like, stop fighting. I don't care why you're fighting. It's the normal reaction. It made me pause and kind of listen to them and reason with them. And then I, and I'm not saying I need to be medicated to do that, but in that moment, like Sabo said, it made me realize something. So from, I took that from that point forward, dealing with them non-medicated, I will sit there and reason with them and listen to what they have to say. Cause just because I think the fighting is nonsense between two kids, it actually, how nonsensical is it means something to them in their heads. So that, you know, kind of helped me in that way. Can I ask a question? Uh, when when was like the first time you guys introduced that cannabis to your kids? Because that's one of the biggest things that's on my mind is like how and when to introduce it to my child. In utero. <laughs> uh, for me, it was when they started to ask questions and being in the cannabis industry, one of the biggest things was they would always see the leaf, right? And then they would start to see the leaf in other places. And they'd be like, daddy, that's your leaf. Daddy, that's your leaf. That's your work leaf. Mm -hmm. And they would start to ask questions. So I, I slowly started to introduce, tell them what, I, what it was I did, what I was involved in. And then it grew from there. And like my daughter shows more interest in it than my son. And my daughter actually comes to the garden and helps me grow. And yeah. it's got, you know, one of my favorite moments this past summer was her under the microscope. And she says, wow, daddy, trichomes are cool. How could anybody hate this plant? <laughs> oh, man. Damn. I wouldn't rule out showing and teaching about success stories, too, because, um, there's some marvelous stories out there from people that exited a dozen plus psychotropics, pain medicine that you no know, conventional doctors have no problem piling on to somebody. And they don't care how their parents in that home, how they're living life as a human or, you know, adulting, if you will. And then you got people that are just off the wall. I say off the wall, that are just miracles. And um, you know, even she knew of, um, you know, Cindy May, and um, we had a person in town that we were living in that had um, seizures, and the only thing that was actually keeping them viable and um, alive was the plant. And it was at that time, I can't remember, I actually looked for the book out in the storage earlier, but there's a couple of books floating around. And it was an author out of Maine, and it was about um the uh, uh what was it? Daddy grows his plants outside. It was something as simple as that, and it just showed the story about an old farmer who grew his plants outside and did it with his whole family. Everything was normalized, and it used to be a staple book that she wanted to read as she was growing up. I mean, she's um seven now, going to be eight in September, and. I couldn't be more proud of some of the questions that she asked. She asked a lot of the good questions around here. And, you know, it's, it's kind of like how we grew up. I mean, you remember Mr. Yuck, right? That green face with the symbol when you put on cleaner bottles and stuff like that. I mean, I'm not even equating that to cannabis right now, but that's pretty much how we've always approached it was, you know, this is medicine. This is a plant. If you see it, don't touch it. Tell an adult ask a question and it's not that it's ever left out or tangible it's just that's how it is like if it ever is if they were ever to find it by themselves they know not to touch it um they've seen the six the success stories firsthand for themselves and um i'm just i'm man i am glad i'm not the dad to them that i was for my first two because i was snowed like I was on all sorts of filthy prescription medications and I barely remember, and I was working a butt ton too. I couldn't, I couldn't imagine that with these two, not even a little bit, but 
as far as normalizing that conversation, don't be afraid to show them success stories. Like even the, the crazy heroic ones, like, cause they're worth it. And even the sad ones where, you know, the plant or strain disappears and well, bad things happen, you know, cause it, it, the plant's going to get its time. It, it, it's, it's, it's coming. And, um, they're the ones that are going to be part of the history, you know, right, right behind us. Yeah. Um, you got an exciting time coming. <laughs> That's, That's a great, it's sure. a great point, Sean, too, about the for prescription sure. stuff. It, you know, I've used that with my children as well as kind of a, not only education for cannabis, but a deterrent towards opiates because that's, as my kids enter the teenage years, that's a very difficult conversation that I think we as parents are facing now that my parents didn't have to have that kind of conversation with me in my teenage years because opiates and prescription pills weren't as prevalent or as accessible. So I've used it as this is nature, this is chemistry. And they understand that it's like walk outside, see the tree, that's nature. Come inside. These are chemicals under the sink. These are manufactured and made. And I've, I've used that to begin those talks about manufactured and prescription pills so that they know that that's something else that's coming down the line that I want them to be educated about before they, it ever comes around from their peers. hundred percent. I mean, I'm sure I can't see everybody right now, but I'm sure if I asked everybody to raise their hand, if opiates or even narcotics has, you know, directly affected their lives, it would probably be an astounding, you know, hands up. Because, like, even nowadays, you can't swing a dead cat with somebody without hitting somebody that's been affected by it. Like, it, it, that is not it has no boundaries. Cat body. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> What'd you say? So what? Swing a dead cat. That's a new one for me. Veterinarians <laughs> don't love it. You, you can't swing you can't swing a wet washcloth without hitting somebody <laughs> but seriously like it, it, it knows no bounds it'll get its folks in anyone's brain it doesn't care age sex creed religion identity if it wants you it's going to take you and i think we all know that by now and as long as we can teach them that we're doing our job how, um, how, Joe, how open do you intend to be with your kids as they get older? Do you think, are they going to grow up having this conversation? Oh, definitely. Um, you know, I, I grew up the, the son of a couple of hippies, so it, they didn't, you know, hide it, but they weren't maybe super open with me about it for a while. But then as soon as I got to that age where I was asking questions, they didn't try and hide it. They said, yeah, when we go down to, to Aunt Catherine's house, like, yeah, we, we smoke a little weed and, you know, we, it's, it's just like at parties, you know, they, they would have some drinks and you kind of see that happening. And I think what really helped with that is I never saw them out of control, whether it was, you know, booze or whether it was weed, they, they never took it to the point where they weren't still like able to, you know, you know, nurture me and, and be caring and kind and, and attentive to me and all that stuff. And it just helped me understand that, like, regardless of whatever stuff I'm hearing at school about, you know, all drugs are bad and, and all this stuff that, you know, this very black and white conversation, they were able to help me understand the nuance of it where, yes, I mean, cannabis or, or you know, weed or whatever we were calling it is a, is a drug but so is Tylenol, you know, and so is alcohol. So people use these things in different ways. And it's, it's not, it's not as clear cut as just, it's always bad. You know, some people use it for fun. Other people use it to, to help them, you know, medicate and get through a day. Very true. But yeah, I mean, thinking about when I'll tell it to my kids. Yeah. As soon as they ask questions, you just yeah, tell it like it is. Yeah, I was fortunate. It was one of the things I had chatted about last night with the on the moms panel is that I was really fortunate to have a mom who was super open with me about her experiences with a variety of different um, things in the 70s, 60s and 70s. It was a different time back then. 
Um, but you know, she was really open with me and honest about about those uh, those experiences. So I feel like I made as a teenager better decisions. How do you guys feel? You, well, Joe just spoke to this, but does anybody else want to chip in on how they feel their drug parenting as as a child um, affects their uh, their their future parenting on the subject of drugs? I can say, like, I grew up in a household where you know. Um, I seen a lot of, I've seen a lot of weed and I actually stayed away from, I stayed away from smoking or any type of drugs, honestly, up until like 24. So like I smoked my first blunt, like around 24, 23, 24. So I'm kind of late to the party, but, um, I, I have one of those, uh, personalities when I like something I dive in and that's what I did. And now I'm here. So, um, I, my mom was really uh everybody in my everybody in my family smoked so it was really just it was it was just what was done in my household you know it was never nothing I, I never wanted to go there and you know grab the blunt after she hit it you know smoke the roach I never wanted to do none of that stuff I just I seen everybody doing it and um me being the oldest oldest child I was just like I'm going to be the one that sets the example not to do that type of stuff. And, you know, that didn't go well because they started, my younger brother, my younger sister started smoking too. So it was whatever. But um, I I definitely see now, though, like as being an adult, I understand why that was in her lifestyle so much. She had three kids, single mother, you know, 30. I, I, I thought about this before. I was like, I'm 30. When I turned 30, I had no kids and I had really, I wasn't doing shit. And I, my mom, I was like, my mom had three kids, you know, teenage kid, you know, a teenager uh, going to, in high school and she's just doing it by herself. And, you know, I, I really had to, you know, just sit back and like, damn, she, she was amazing. So any type of, you know, vice that she had, she definitely deserved. So, you know, now that I'm older, I understood that. And, you know, I'm grateful for her to even show me this plant and, and have it implemented in my you know childhood. So definitely thanks, Ma. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, um, Darrell, you got the best adventure coming up for you. You know, if my wife didn't tell me the factory was closed, I would love to have a third child. It is like the best experience possible. And you know, you know, like just to kind of bring it back to when you were asking like how to deal with it with your kids, you know, like my kids, you know, they know how to use Google. So I've always been like very just transparent and honest with them because I realize, you know, building trust is very hard, but breaking it is very quick, you know? So the best I could do to just keep building the trust so that when they get into their curious teenage years, you know, they'll still be open to speaking to dad because dad's not judging. Dad's not trying to, you know, tell them anything or scare them off. I'm just here to talk about the truth. So I think if you're ever wondering what to say, you know, you could always rely on the truth. And I really apologize. I am hosting an event myself at four o'clock now. I got the time zones mixed up. I actually invited Sean and, and Mike um, uh, uh, and Scott as well. Um, so if any of you guys, I'm so sorry, I do have to drop off, but to all the other dads, Sean, Darrell, Scott, um, Kara, great job, Joe as well. I know you got twins that I, I like, my head is like anxious just thinking about if I had to take care of twins. So thank you to all you fathers and I hope to spend some more time with you guys in the future. Thank you, Shane. Thank you for participating, Sabo. Thank you, Sabo. Thank you. So we'll much. talk soon, bud. Talk soon. Before we wrap up today, I do want to, um, we, we want to um, send all of our love and support from BCW and Elevate uh, to Baby Shay, the beautiful daughter of Kim Napoli and John Napoli, two Massachusetts cannabis pioneers. Um, unfortunately, Baby Shay was diagnosed with a rare form of blood cancer uh, at, in October of 2020. And um, recently, because of um, Kim Napoli was working for Parallel, um, and she was recently let go of her position because her husband opened his retail store in a town. Now they aren't working together. They aren't sharing information. All of this was very open and uh, Parallel Netta has terminated her employment based on conflict of interest. And this is as 
Kim is the only person of color on their board of directors, on their executive board, or um, in their executive administration, excuse me. And she is uh, the, the head of equity and um, and uh, equity initiatives for Parallel. And it was, you know, and it was an open fact about this potent this the fact that John, her husband, um, was opening a store. And on top of that, her baby is going through like you know a year of treatments for uh, a blood cancer so they do have um, a gofundme account it's baby shay um help baby shay beat cancer shay is s-h-e-a um and you can make donations there to help them stay on top of the um you know uh, constantly accruing medical expenses that come with a situation like that um and you know let's all point out the fact that Baby Shay does not have access to cannabis medicine in the hospital. Um, so this is another instance where cannabis, which should be a first line of defense against um, you know, impending health issues, where it is going to continue to be treated like a last resort. And so um, I know that Baby Shay is participating in all of her her appointments by her traditional Western medica medicines, as well as Eastern medicines and virtual medicines and herbal medicines um, that are legal and allowed in the hospital and approved by her her team of doctors. So um, you know, if you can give to that fund. Yeah. We'll, we'll make sure we post the link to the GoFundMe on the BCW page so people can find it. And, and definitely big shout out, like, you know, give it up to Kim and, you know, her husband for even documenting this whole, this whole thing with their, with their child. So that's something big in itself. And that, that's, I, I couldn't even imagine. So no you know, parent should ever have to go through it. Exactly. You know, heart goes out to them. Please, please run there, go funny up and help them as much as possible. Yeah. Well said, though. We'll make sure that we get that link up. Um, so people know where to go to donate to that. Excellent. Thank you all for participating in this dad's panel. Um, I definitely do, you know, a couple of people pointed out, you know, it's parenting's parenting. What could be the difference between, you know, moms and dads having the same conversation twice, but I absolutely, I've got to participate in both of these conversations and you know, there was a lot of things that are very different perspective for dads in, in how how you answer questions, the topics you want to talk about, they're different than moms and how they how they discuss, you know, subjects. Like, we didn't really touch pregnancy and we talked about that a lot yesterday. So there definitely are differences in how our relationships are with our kids and receive, but obviously like everyone that has participated this weekend is an incredibly caring, loving parent. Um, who has a lot to offer the rest of the parents um, and all of the parents around the world with their advice and, and guidance and awareness and um, education of the subject of cannabis and parenting. So thank you all here tonight and all the moms from last night for participating and thank Lisa and Scott and Boston Cannabis Week for um, putting this together and um, getting us all up here and uh, I look forward to the next one. Maybe we should do cousins of cannabis users. <laughs> and I'll talk about I'm, what we do on Fourth of July after dinner. I'm, I'm sure. You, you know, it, it it's funny because you know, just a real a real quick story about that is my uncle. I he battled lymphoma for 15 years, and cannabis was a big part of it. And used to have to go down to Revere to pick him up to come for Thanksgiving, and I knew he smoked. And I brought my brother down when my brother just started college and we go to pick him up and we're sitting in the living room and my aunt comes in and says, okay, boys, just wait right here. Jimmy will twist one up. And my brother looked at me like a deer <laughs> in headlights. and we ended up smoking with my aunt and uncle on the way to Thanksgiving dinner. And my brother sitting, the two of us sitting at Thanksgiving dinner that year was priceless. So. That might not be a bet. That might be a fun conversation to have, Kara. I'm having a meltdown. <laughs> on cue. Somebody fell asleep on the couch and then got woken up abruptly and now there's a meltdown. Well, thank you everyone for participating. Um, Kara, Lisa and I, Boston Cannabis Week, can't thank you enough for all that you do for us as the director of education. 
Um, you and Elevate Northeast, you guys are fantastic. Joe, thank you for participating as always. And, you know, none of this would be possible without the support of MCR Labs from day one. So thank you to all of you guys. You are all amazing fathers. And thank you for all the insight and all the advice and all the support from you guys, man. This is amazing. Darrell, best, best of luck, man. Appreciate you, man. I'm going from the skunkle to the dad now. You know what I mean? I was, I was getting <laughs> this, you know what I mean? I was just being the one that just, the smoking uncle. That was me. But now we're going to daddy mode. So I'm well, you know what? We're, we're going to make sure we do, we do an update panel in a year so we can Please. see how things are going for you. you know, I have my little one with me right here with me, man. I can't wait, man. I appreciate all you guys. Appreciate BCW. Appreciate MCR Labs. Kara, everybody, Judge. You guys are great. Uh, thank you again, man. This is, this is, this is great. This is great going into daddy. This is dope. Thank you guys. Hey man, hit us up. You got a support system if you need it. Yeah, absolutely. Sean, you as well, man, anything you need, you can always uh, inbox me. Uh, you know, anything we could do to help and support anything you're going through as well, man. Appreciate yeah, it's, you being here. it's dope being back in touch and, um, you know, it's, it sucks being off the radar for a while, um, you know, and seeing the industry and seeing doing what it's doing. But then, like, you throw out an, SS, an SOS call and, you know, guess who's showing up, you know, the OGs and the one, the real ones. So thank you guys. Thank you, Kara and Scott, for, you know, being there because you know what it's like. Absolutely. Appreciate man. it. Know yeah, what it's like. <laughs> that was a great All right. Have a great evening, everyone. Good night, Thanks man. so much. Thank you for participating. Thank you. I'm going to say hi. Hi. Hi, Dash. <laughs> <laughs> <He's> so cute. <laughs> Take it easy, everyone. Good night. Good night. <laughs>